Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 3 through 19 here this, this evening. Now, we've looked at verses 1 and 2 in great detail in our last two studies. If you have not been here for those studies, I encourage you to pick up the CDs and in our bookstore afterward and, and keep up with us as we go through uh, these incredible passages of Scripture. So let's just read verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So in verses 1 and 2, we have God's basic creation of all matter. And so now he begins to form that matter. In verse 3, Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Now there's an order here in each of these days of creation that I think you need to uh, see. There's a, there's a plan. And the Lord follows this plan in each one of these days of creation. And so first he declares his creative word and he creates whatever he is going to create. And then he reports its effect, what happened after he created whatever he created. And then he declares his evaluation of what he has created, that it is good. And then he numbers the day. So in each of the days of creation, you see this model or this plan as he, as he begins to create these specific things. And so his spe specific creative works are described here. He takes the basic elements that he created originally, and now he begins to form it. Because it says the earth was without form. So now he begins to form the matter that he has created. And so the first step, the first day of creation, is to create the most important thing, and that is light. Very important. The first step in bringing order out of the chaos of that which is without form and void is to create light. So light is essential to all life. Light allows some of the most important aspects of life to take place. The most important, I think, is what's called photosynthesis. Now again, you probably can think back to your science classes, and photosynthesis is one of the most basic processes of light. So a plant takes light and it takes that energy and it converts that energy into chemical energy. And then it's used to fuel that organism. And so what a plant then does is it, it extracts CO2 from the atmosphere and replaces that with oxygen. So you and I can breathe. So light is essential to bring that about. So basically, the first step in bringing order out of chaos is light. So this is one of the most basic functions of life. Without light, there is no life. Now, it's interesting that Paul takes this very same issue of light and he applies this spiritually to our spiritual lives. And he declares that basically bringing order out of our life and the chaos of a life of sin is when God gives you spiritual light. Let me read this to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. Paul here speaking of the gospel, he says, If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing whose mind the God of this age 
has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown, shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So isn't it interesting? Paul takes here the very same specific issue of God creating life, that first step of bringing order out of chaos in a physical world. And he does the very same thing in your spiritual world. Now, do you remember what it was like when the Lord opened your eyes to the light of the gospel? Do you remember that point in your life? Maybe you were a child Maybe you were an adult, but there's a point in time where all of a sudden one day it's like your eyes are open and you get it. I mean, I went to church maybe once or twice, a couple of times in my, my childhood. And I went through my middle school years and high school years, college years, apart from the Lord. And all of a sudden somebody shared the gospel with me. And I, it was like I had never heard it before. My eyes were open. Light came into me. And I understood exactly what was being said. As Paul said here, that as God commanded light to shine out of darkness, he has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So, God gave you that knowledge, you understood it, you were receptive to it. That was the function of the light of God. God who is light created light here upon the earth. An incredible feat. Now note that God's creative ability here is to speak light into existence. I love that. It says, God said let there be light. So his creative word spoke this light into existence. In Psalm 33, verse 6, it says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He just said it, and it was done. That's power. That's mighty power. I love it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. There the apostle says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And then he makes this last statement. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. That is the most incredible statement by the Apostle. The things that we see are made out of things that we cannot see, that are invisible to the naked eye. An atom, a molecule, your DNA. I mean, things that we understand today that they had no concept of in these days, but they knew them by faith. The things that were created, that we see, that are visible, are made out of things that are invisible. Incredible. And so God makes this statement over and over again throughout this first chapter. Uh, here in verse 6, it says, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. We'll get to this in a moment. Verse 9, Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place. And then again in verse 14. And then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and for years. And so you see this the same method all the way through this, these creative days here listed for us in 
Genesis 1. Now, one of the great destructive heresies that has come from this act of God of speaking into existence light and all that we see around us is a teaching that basically is a misunderstanding of a verse of Scripture. And it's partly in, in due to a translation problem in some of the translations. And it comes in Mark eleven twenty two, where it says, Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Now, that is the correct translation. Some translations have, have the faith of God. And so the faith movement today basically teaches that you can speak things into existence yourself. That if you have really real faith, then you can speak and it is done as well. And that is just not what the Bible teaches. Uh, they also go on to say that you're a little God, little g, little o, little d. Well, I'm anything and you're anything but a little g, little o, little d. We are human beings and we may think we're gods, but we will die like men, every one of us. And so this, this problem comes basically from just not simply understanding what the scripture teaches. Let me read to you Romans chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. There Paul says, As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, referring to Abraham, in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he, Abraham, became the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. So God spoke beforehand that Abraham would have descendants, even though he had none. So who was it that spoke as and declared that this would be the fact? It wasn't Abraham. In fact, Abraham struggled in faith to believe he was going to have one child, let alone any, any more than that. And so it was God who said this. Notice, God who calls those things which do not exist as though they did. God is the one who speaks in this manner. And man does not have that ability. So remember that when you hear that particular teaching because it... It floats in and out of the church continuously, and so be careful. Now note here that there is light before the sun and the moon. Now many uh, evolutionary teachers will t make real major hay over this particular fact. They say, well, wait a minute here. It says that down in verse 14 and 15 that and 16, that's when the sun and the moon were created. So how can you have light without the sun and the moon? And so they think they've got you. Well, you don't need light. You can have light without a sun and a moon. You can have light without that secondary source. It's very interesting that in the book of Revelation, in chapter 22, verse 5, it says there, on the new earth, and there shall be no night there. They, neither, they need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So in the new heaven, there's light, and there's no sun. So, I guess God doesn't need a sun to give you light. Again, in Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 through 23, the Israelites had light when there was no light of the sun shining. Remember one of the plagues of Egypt. In Exodus 10 there, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness which may even be felt. 
So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. So basically, God doesn't need a sun to give light. God can create light in any way he sees so fit. Now, science defines light as being a form of energy that is just visible to the human eye. It's, mo it's the motion of an electron around a nucleus of an atom. That's what emits light. They are motivated, they're, they're in motion, and that's what creates light. Just electrons. Now, God can create electrons any way he wants to. He doesn't need the light that comes from the sun or our, the star that is in our solar system. So he can do whatever he chooses. And so the idea of light coming and then notice, notice at the end of this section here, he says, verse 5, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, if there is light and then there is darkness, then that means that the earth is rotating at this particular point. And so you have a clear indication that this is what is taking place. Now, are these, are these days here that are described, are they 24-hour periods of time, or are they long hundreds of millions of geological ages? Hundreds of millions of years. Which, which is it? Well, I think, obviously, if you read this, there's no figurative language used here, which means that the common sense rendering and reading of the text would mean day, night, that's a 24-hour period of time. It's one day. The word yom, which is the Hebrew word here, is used almost exclusively in reference to a literal day. And so just the common sense reading of this, the meaning of the Hebrew word, would indicate a 24-hour day. Moses, he defined the days of creation as a 24-hour period of time. In Exodus 20, verse 11, it says, Therefore, in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that was in them, and rested the seventh day. So that's pretty clear. He's using a seven-day week of time that is normal for us to assume that's what he's talking about. He's talking about six days and a Sabbath day rest. And six days, God created the heavens and the universe, and he rested the seventh. And so I think the common sense rendering of this is, uh, reveals the case. God doesn't need hundreds of millions of years to do anything. He can do whatever he pleases to do by just speaking it into existence. So when you have to put hundreds of millions of years and then billions of years for the earth to exist, that is to basically make room for the evolutionary teaching that is so prominent in our schools and higher education today. I mean, you will, if you say you believe in six days, I mean, I had a professor uh, and it was the very first day of uh, class that I took that uh, it was an anthropology class and the, the professor got up and he said, I wanna ask, is there anybody here that believes in creation? Please raise your hand. And three or four people in the back of the room raised their hand and he proceeded to tell them they were a bunch of idiots. And he mocked them. And he harassed them the entire class. 
it, it was, I just sat there and I thought, I'm not going to say anything in this class because I don't even know what evolution is at that point. And so I was sitting there thinking to myself, these poor people. But I didn't know what I believed. I was a non-Christian at this point. And so I sat there and listened. I went, oh, wow, that's really great. That sounds so, so plausible. But the only problem is, is they don't give you the other evidence. And that's what I'm going to give you is the other evidence in, these, in our next studies. So when we come to that portion, we will, we will deal with it. And so the earth is experiencing what is called a day-night cycle or a dark light cycle, which reveals that the earth is round and it is rotating. So very important. The earth is not flat. God knew that the earth wasn't flat because he's the one who created it. And the scripture declares that the earth was not flat. In Isaiah 40, verse 22, it says, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. So the one who created the earth sits above the circle of the earth. This particular statement is made several times in the Old Testament. So many of the Old Testament writers inspired by the Holy Spirit to write, they knew that the earth was round. In Job 26, verse 7, there Job makes a, this statement. He, referring to God, stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. Now, does that sound like he knows what's up? He does. He spreads the, the, he stretches out the north over empty space. I mean, there's, there's a lot of empty space out there in our universe. I mean, it was only the 1600s when, when astronomers thought that there were a thousand stars in the sky. That's what they said. A thousand stars. They had no idea how far and how wide and how large the universe is. Even Jesus speaking about his return. He spoke about people that would all meet him when he returned. But they would all be in different circumstances. It says in Luke 17, verses 34 through 36, speaking of his return, he said, I will tell you that in that night... There will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. So I guess Jesus understood that the world was round and that when he returned, there would be people in bed. There would be people grinding, which was what they did in the morning time because they ground their meal and then they made their bread. And then there would be people in the field working. So the scripture is very clear. God knew that the earth was round a long time before scientists figured it out. So when people tell you, oh, the Bible, it's so archaic, it really has no scientific value at all. They have no idea what they're talking about. And so this whole concept, I think, of the earth being round and its setting in the universe is very clear. Now, the second day of creation, verses 6 through 8. Let's read. Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. 
So the evening and the morning were the second day. So here on the second day, we have the first time the word made is used. Notice down in verse 7. God made the firmament. Now this is a different Hebrew word from God created. The word created is the Hebrew word bara. It means to create out of nothing. To make something, well, the Bible doesn't ever say that man creates anything, that man creates something out of nothing, because we can't do that. But it does say man makes things out of existing material. And so that's the difference between these two words. And so God has made the original space and matter. Now he is forming that matter and he is dividing that matter. And so here, he, this word made literally means to fashion or organize out of existing material. It says in Genesis 3, verse 7, it says then, and this is referring to after Adam and Eve fell. It says, then their eyes were both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. That word made is the same word here. It is to make out of existing material. Very important distinction between what God does and what man does. So here God separates the atmospheric waters from the terrestrial waters that are on the earth. Notice it says there is water that is above the firmament or under the firmament and waters which are above the firmament. So under and above. So there's this space in between. So what is this space called? It's called the firmament. Some translations have expanse or it would be what we would call the sky. And so in Genesis 1:20, notice, here is a definition of what the firmament is. Genesis 1.20, Then God said, Let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. And so this firmament is literally the skies. Now, the idea and the term heaven is used three different ways in the scripture. The first way is describing this atmospheric heaven, which is the heavens above us. In Jeremiah 4.25, there Jeremiah said, I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. So birds fly in the firmament of the heaven, or the expanse of the atmospheric heaven above us. And then there is a starry heaven, or where the stars and the constellations dwell. In Isaiah 13, verse 10, there he says, this is in reference to the judgment of God. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cast its light to shine. This is in reference to the future tribulation period where that Jesus referred to in Matthew 24 when he referred to the sun not giving its light, the moon not reflecting light anymore. So this is a reference, a prophetic reference to this very same time. But again, the stars of heaven. So there's a starry heaven. And then there is the throne of God, also described as heaven. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, is the best reference for this. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So there's an atmospheric heaven, a starry heaven, where the constellations are, and then where the throne of God is 
in specific. Now, the atmosphere around the earth is described in Scripture as like a big tent. It's very interesting. Let me read this to you. In Isaiah 40, verse 22, we read this a moment ago. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. And that is really an, a very appropriate description of what our atmosphere is around the earth. Our atmosphere has a very important purpose, which we will look at in just a moment. Some planets, of course, have very little atmosphere, and our moon is about the same distance from the sun as we are, and the, there is very little, if any, atmosphere on the, on the surface of the moon. But the problem with that is that the temperature ranges are from plus 200 degrees to minus 200 degrees, depending on whether you're in the sun or whether you're on the, in the dark side of the moon. So that doesn't sound like life could exist in that, in that particular setting. So it's an airless, atmospherically less situation. So the atmosphere that we have around us has tremendous benefits. That is why God created, because without the atmosphere, these things could not take place. The atmospheric pressure on the earth is what keeps the waters of the earth from dissipating. If you don't have light, you don't have life. If you don't have water, you don't have life either. It's a very important uh, reason for atmosphere. Also, the ozone in our atmosphere, which is from about 6 miles to about 30 miles up in our atmosphere, blocks the ultraviolet light and rays that come from our sun. If you don't have ozone and, and an atmosphere, that ozone that is kept in our atmosphere, then those ultraviolet rays will destroy human beings. It will destroy your, your cells and even your DNA. So it's very important that we have it. Our atmosphere prevents meteors from reaching the earth. The atmosphere creates friction, which burns up most of those uh, meteorites that, that come into our atmosphere. Some of them, of course, that are huge, they make it here to the earth. But our atmosphere is protecting us from a whole lot of incredible stuff that is floating around out in space. Why? Because there's life on this planet that God has created. The atmosphere permits the formation of clouds, which allows the distribution of water by rain and by snow. If you don't distribute the water upon the face of the earth, then again, you have a problem with life. And our atmosphere is like a, a blanket, a tent that traps our, the oxygen and the nitrogen that is in our atmosphere so that we can breathe. So there's a whole lot of reasons why we need an atmosphere. And that's why God created it. He creates light, and then he creates this atmosphere. Now notice that there's water above the earth. Now many times people say, well, water above the earth and then on the earth. Why is this necessary? Well, Literally, this is probably the reason why most of the people that you see before the flood lived such long lives. I mean, some as, as long as 900 years. So how can somebody live that, that long? And why don't we live that long today? Well, it's interesting that after the flood, this water that was above the firmament was gone. Notice Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. It 
It says there, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And it poured out this water that was above the earth. Now, scientists say that if there was this canopy of water around the earth, this would have protected our earth even more than today. It would have made the earth like a big, huge terrarium. And up until that time, the Bible we will find later on here says that there was a mist that came up out of the ground. Now that sounds like a terrarium to me. If any of you have had a terrarium in your, your house, that's how it works. And so with this canopy of water around the earth, that's why men would have lived such long periods of time. Now if you go to Genesis 11, and beginning in verses 10 and following, you will see after the flood that every generation men lived shorter and shorter lifespan. That it goes from 500 years, 400 years, 300, 200, down to Abraham. I mean, and so you've got basically the same lifespan as what we have today after the flood. And so it is very probable, I think it is, it's a rational, uh, logical understanding of what took place. Now, evolutionary scientists do not believe in a global flood because if you believe in a global flood, you have to believe in the reason for the global flood, which is sin, and you have to believe in a God who would bring a global flood and they do not believe in either of those items. And so that is the reason why people move in that direction. And yet there is great evidence. When we come to, the, to Noah's flood, I'm telling you, I've got some evidence for you that will blow your mind. That is such proof. I mean, do you, do you know that on Mount Everest, there are fossils? Fossils. So, how did a fossil get up that high? There's only one answer, and that is that the earth, at some point in time, was underwater. So, the third day of creation, verse 9. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And God brought forth grass and herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. So God causes now the waters and the dry land under the expanse to be gathered into one place. And so the waters are all in one place. The land is all in one place on this sphere we call earth. So when first did the land masses separate? That's one of the most important questions people ask. When did this take place? Well, the Bible does not explain exactly when the, earth, the continents separated. But most likely... It took place during the flood for this reason. In Psalm 104, verse 8, in the English Standard Version, which is probably uh, that or the New American Standard is probably the best translation of this passage. It says, The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them. So the valleys became mountains, 
the mountains became valleys. This would clearly explain the reason and why a fossil could be found on Mount Everest. It's, it clearly gives us an understanding of why some places on the earth, the ocean is deeper than it is in other places. And there are higher mountains in certain places than in others. The earth was dramatically, radically changed during the flood. The earth broke apart and the, well, scientists tell us, I mean, in the center of the United States, there's, uh, there's several states that are fighting over the water that is underneath their states because they're all trying to tap that water. And so there's incredible water aquifers underneath the earth, all over the earth. And so these waters came out and the waters from above came down. The mountains rose and the valley sank. I think that's probably the best place and best uh, reasoning as to where the continents separated, which would tell you what a cataclysmic event the flood was. It was not a little rain for a short period of time. It was a cataclysmic event. In Genesis chapter 10, verse 25, is another option. Uh, many point to this particular passage. It says, uh, to Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, and in his days the earth was divided. What he means by that, he does not tell us. And so, some believe that this is when the continents divided. But personally, I go for the time of the flood because this would have been a... I don't think there's a continental... There may be a little drift because of the, the plates up around the earth at the pl present time. But to move thousands and thousands of miles apart from each other, that would have to be a cataclysmic event. And it would not, it wouldn't be a little 6.0 earthquake. It would be a 20 on the Richter scale. So anyway, so how then God creates here the, the grasses, the fruit trees, and all the vegetation on the earth. Now again, people say, well, how could God do that? Uh, don't. Grasses need sunlight to f experience photosynthesis. Don't they need that? Well, if you have 100 or 200 million years of certain geological ages, then obviously this wouldn't work, which only proves to you, and I think is only further evidence, that these are 24-hour periods of time. Because the very next day after this vegetation is created, the sun is created. So, can your plants exist overnight without sunlight? Sure they can. So, all the vegetation on the earth could exist for 12 hours until the sun was created. So again, evolutionists point to this particular fact and they say, Oh, I got you here. Not if it's 24-hour period in a day. If it's 100 or 200 million years, yeah, I can see that wouldn't work. So, it's your choice. Now note one last thing here in this section. You find for the first time uh, this statement made that God created these vegetation after its kind. The fruit trees and herbs after its kind because they have their seeds within itself, which is obviously how those, those plant lives or those trees reproduce themselves. And so it says here they produced after their kind. Now, for scientists today, they would call that a species or a genus. And so basically you can take your choice. This is a statement that God makes concerning his creation that 
He creates after, and all things will be creating and reproducing after its kind. When we get to God's creation of the animals in our next study, he says the same thing. They, cre- they are created. They are then reproducing after their kind. Very important because this really is a refuting the evolutionary teaching that we all came from a common ancestry. Now, probably one of the best proofs for this is the fossil record. I would encourage you in our bookstore, we have a, a book called Evolution, The Fossils Say No by Dr. Dwayne Gish. Uh, Dr. Gish has, uh, well, just read the back of the book, read his credentials. Uh, he's somebody I could believe. And he said, when you look at the fossil record, what do you find? Do you see all these transitional forms from one species to another? Or do you see all of the animal life, all the plant life that we have on the earth today, all similar in the fossil record at that time? He said there are hundreds of thousands of millions of fossils found around the earth. Which again is a proof that these particular animals and plant life were all created, ready to go at one time because they all appear in the fossil record abruptly with no transitional forms. If we have been here for a couple of hundred million years or billion years, whichever you like, there should be a whole lot of transitional forms seen in the fossil record. But they are not found. And so it is proof, basically, that God created and then these plant life, plant uh, and trees, and the animals we will get to in our next study all became, came into existence all at one time. And then God allowed them to reproduce after their own kind. Amen. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you for your incredible creative power. And Lord, I thank you that you have, Lord, sent your light into our lives. Lord, you've opened our eyes so that we might see and know you. And Lord, we thank you that you can take our lives from wherever we've been, whatever we've done, and you can turn us around. And you can make us into new creatures, new creations. Lord, we thank you for that incredible work you have done in each of our lives. Lord, we just open our hearts to you tonight. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would would just take these truths and break them over our heart. Lord, if you can create the heavens, the universe, the waters, the plant life, light itself. Lord, you can create and do whatever you please in our lives. Lord, fill us with faith that we might trust you to do what is necessary in each of our lives. Lord, we're all in a different place. We all have different needs. But you see them. You know them. Lord, transform us, change us by your mighty power. We believe you to do that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.